Control. Identity. And access. Management. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? Not so bad. Yourself? Well, I got to admit, I'm a little somber today. I'm I'm actually in mourning. I was um, reading an article on ZDNet, and uh, apparently the password is now dead. Oh, uh, this, again. This was, pr- <laughs> this was pronounced by Bill Gates. I mean, let me check the date on the article. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The article was from 2004. So I don't know. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> you had me there for a second, and then and then you got me. So congratulations, uh, uh, you won that round. Uh, yeah, we've been here. The passwords have been dying for years, and you know, even the current approach with passwordless authentication still generally still means that there is somewhere still a password somewhere sitting behind the scenes. So maybe someday we'll get there. That's the punchline. Yeah, exactly. Well, today we're going to talk about identity certification. And we've got a guest to help us out. And I think this is going to be a great one for folks to to listen to. Um, As part of that identity certification uh, conversation, we've brought in the founder and president of the Identity Management Institute, Henry Bagdasarian, to help us out with that. Hey, Henry, how are you doing? Great. Thank you. Hello to you guys and to your uh, listener. Thanks for having me on today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I think you know this is going to be hopefully informative for people who are out there that are either in the IMS space already, which let's be honest, if you're listening to identity management podcast, that's probably where you fall, right? Uh, this is where this is where people kind of congregate around. Um, but for folks who um, you know want to get into the space or maybe have you know some questions around certifications, I'm hoping we'll get to to kind of talk around some of the things that the Identity Management Institute offers. And, but before we get that, you know, I think it's always helpful that when we talk through um, this is to understand our guest background and how do they come to be where there are. So maybe you can kind of help us out and tell us, how did you get into the identity and access management industry? Is it something that you chose or did it choose you? Thank you. Um, so I guess it's both, right? So my, my professional career started in information technology auditing right, IT audit, which includes basically the assessment of general system security controls and application controls. Uh, Depending on a project scope in any um, IT audit, all areas of risks are assessed. And one of the main areas of focus is pretty much um, system security and uh, the assessment of uh, the risks within the security of the systems. And also for compliance and external audits, a security assessment is often part of the scope so after uh, a few years of managing global IT audit teams, I transitioned into information security management, which was uh, a very natural transition, uh, uh, basically based on what I just said. And as a chief information security officer, my security team was um, always responsible for assessing the security risks and making recommendations to improve the security uh, of the organization. Uh, so in, in, in security management, we typically look into um, onboarding and offboarding processes, access provisioning, the provisioning processes, and, and basically perform um, system access review to avoid any kind of access creep. So, you know, if, if you're part of a security team, you probably perform a periodic access audit and recertification, um, which is the last A in the triple A framework in identity and access management, which stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting or auditing, as I call it. And one thing that people may not um, pay attention to is that the triple A framework in identity access management is a major contributor to the cybersecurity objectives of CIA, which is the confidentiality, integrity, and availability uh, of systems and data. So for me, it was a very uh, natural transition into identity and access management, which was always part of my career, whether I was in IT um, audit or um, uh, cybersecurity. That said, um, also uh, before I started IMI, um, I started an identity theft blog years ago, just to start writing about identity theft and data protection, compliance, and share my information or, or the knowledge that I had on my blog and 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 following that blog uh, based on demand for training and certification, um, IMI was born. So that's, you know, I guess you can say we found each other. 
<laughs> we found each other. I love it. You know, and I, I, I love that story because, you know, I always feel like the folks who are on the audit side and who understand risk and can, can communicate risk really bridge the gap between security and the business and why it's important to secure your systems. And I, I really always think that they're kind of both the smartest people in I am, but also the scariest people. <laughs> you know, right. They can strike fear into your heart. Um, but it's really cool that that you've now founded the Identity Management Institute, or I think we can call it the IMI. Um, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what is the mission of the organization? Yeah, IMI was founded in 2007, so that's over a decade ago, and, and we've grown uh, since then. As I mentioned, we started with identity theft, uh, which was a hot topic at the time, and then five or six years ago, uh, we started expanding into, uh, into identity and access uh, management. So primarily, I would say the uh, IMI was established to pretty much redefine and promote the identity management profession and address all the identity risks, whether it was inside or outside, outside of the information system. And, um, you know, to publish articles and share information with our members. And we also wanted to um, educate people and, and establish an independent certification process for identity management professionals through uh, what we call critical risk domains for each certification program. So each certification program has various chapters and those chapters, what we call a critical risk domains, which addresses the various risks for uh, that particular certification program. So you offer quite a few different certifications, all kind of focused on obviously the identity space, things like certified identity and access manager, access management specialist, identity governance expert, you know, red flag specialist. Can you talk to us about some of these certifications and, you know, who might be kind of ideal fits for each of these? Or is this something where it's a program track and you, you kind of start with one and end up with all of them? Yeah, no, I mean, there is really no flow. I mean, we, we offer in total eight certification programs um, in, in various areas. Uh, and, and we think that collectively these eight certification programs uh, cover all aspects of identity and access management, data protection, identity theft, and compliance. And so um, the, the, one of the categories is governance, right, which deals with policies and standards, oversight, management. And for uh, governance, we have a certification program called Certified Identity Governance Expert. Um, in terms of technology and technical folks who deal with the technical aspects of identity management, um, that may include identity directory management, API, identity federation, system configuration, and as well as system implementation, uh, we offer two programs. Uh, they are a Certified Identity and Security Technologist, CIST, and the SIMP, which is a Certified Identity Management Professional. Um, in terms of operation um, for identity, and access uh, management professionals who deal with uh, risk management uh, or identity lifecycle management and, and transformation, onboarding, offboarding, access resolution, audit compliance, access certification. We offer the certified identity and access manager and certified access management specialist. Uh, and then the two initial certifications that we started in identity theft include the certified identity protection advisor and certified red flag specialist, which uh, the SIPA deals with more on the consumer side, right? So people who are dealing with consumers, uh, educating them or resolving their identity theft issues. And on the CRFS is really for people within companies uh, trying to uh, prevent identity theft or comply with the federal regulation, the red flags rule, uh, these two certifications are perfect for those people. And finally, to bring it all together, um, we uh, created the Certified in Data Protection Program, the CDP, which is uh, uh, pretty much covering uh, its uh, data protection risks uh, according to international standards and also covers privacy. So. There was really never a certification that brought security and privacy together. Uh, there are a lot of security certifications and there is also privacy certifications, but CDP really brings these two areas together um, so that people, uh, the certified members actually understand 
um, the inner connectivity of the two areas, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think it's interesting that you've got kind of a mix of, uh, you know, technical and maybe non-technical certifications, right? Because I think that's something that gets maybe gets lost out there with uh, folks who aren't as familiar with the IM space is that not every role within identity management is technical. There's program managers, there's project managers, there's, you know, business analysts, and, and not just, you know, engineers and, and architects and things like that. So I think it's interesting that you've got, you know, a, a good healthy mix of certifications across the kind of the spectrum of IEM. Um, and it's also the first certification that I've heard of that ties back to the red flag rules, which is something that the U.S. Uh, Federal Trade Commission, I believe, has some, kind of, you know, some kind of um, information around that. So it's the first one I've heard of where it kind of ties back to that that red flag. I'm, I'm assuming that that is a tie back to that. Is that correct? Absolutely. And and uh, it really follows the uh, U.S. Uh, regulation standards and requirements. Uh, not too many people are aware of the red flags rule, by the way, because uh, there hasn't really be, been a uh, government audit or uh, fine some penalties for violating uh, the law, but really all, all companies that deal with personal information, they have to have a red flags uh, or identity theft prevention program in place to prevent identity theft. And, and the CRFS program follows exactly what the government uh, requirements uh, are. So Henry, we love to be the source of breaking news. So I'm going to ask you, are there any other certifications in the pipeline that we can be the, you know, the, it, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, like I mentioned, these eight certifications cover pretty much um, all aspects of um, the risks around identity management, cybersecurity, data protection, identity theft, and compliance. I have a, uh, a, a couple of ideas in mind, but really they haven't, you know, they're still, they're still work in process. We haven't done anything with it, but it's just, a, it's just an idea in my mind at this point. And I'm assuming a lot of those ideas could either be folded into some of these existing certifications or potentially become a, a certification unto themselves. I mean, you know, an area like GDPR, I was wondering, is that something that is a, a topic within cert, certified in data protection? Absolutely. Uh, so for example, the certified in data protection program, the CDP, uh, comes with a um, uh, one hour video, educational video on GDPR. So one of the things that we try not to do, I mean, first of all, we are vendor neutral, right? So we don't talk about any particular product in the market, uh, but also we try to be uh, uh, regulation neutral. So when we talk about privacy in the CDP program, we're really not mentioning any kind of uh, uh, particular reg uh, regulation, but we decided that we're gonna offer on the sideline a GDPR uh, video for educational purposes. So people have a, a pretty, because we think it's a comprehensive one at this point. And so uh, people having knowledge of GDPR requirements is, uh, it would be great for CDP members. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Henry, kind of at a higher level, why would someone want to pursue certification? Uh, good question. And we get that question a lot. Um, I'm a big fan of professional certification myself. Be before we I even launched IMI. Um, I completed many other certifications in internal auditing, IT audit, system security, system and system auditing. So I got pretty much all the certifications in the field. Um, and so I'm a big supporter of certification. Um, but I think in general certification um, in a particular area, let someone learn and gain new knowledge, confirm that knowledge through the examination and certification process and also validate their um, knowledge and improve their resume um, and improving their chances of uh, getting an interview or getting hired. Um, if two people have the same education and experience, uh, a professional cer uh, certification gives them an edge. Um, one of the, one of the uh, questions that I often get is uh, people who um, say that, you know, I'm an expert in my field. I don't need a, a certification to validate who I am or what I know, it, it doesn't. But my answer to them is always, you know, when, when you go for an interview, or you go for a job, you may not be the only expert in that room. So you may be competing with other experts. And so having, having a certification from an independent organization is, is always helpful. It, it, it may be easy to pass the exam because the person has a lot of knowledge and experience, but that, that validates uh, what they know, right? So 
I think having a professional certification uh, other than spending a few dollars um, doesn't have any negative effect on, on someone's resume. It can only add value to their resume, I think. So the benefit, you know, I think is clear on the certified person's, you know, perspective, obviously can be a tiebreaker, right? All things being considered kind of show um, that there has been some, some level of mastery, you know, maybe in conjunction with experience that sets you apart from other folks. What about from an organization, organization's perspective, you know, what are some of the benefits maybe that, that are considered if you're on the hiring side or if you're an organization side where um, they see the benefit from having certified people uh, in the IM space? Well, you know, yeah, certification goes both ways, right? So certification also helps organizations to select the right candidate, right? So having experts in identity and access management in an organization uh, that has critical systems and data reduces the chances of data breach and unauthorized access. Uh, we've published a lot of articles on uh, data breach and the causes of data breach and employee error happens to be on the top of the list. And so, you know, having experts who can explain or educate the uh, user population, um, looking at system configurations and, and doing regular audits uh, is going to reduce the chance of uh, data breach. Uh, and the consequences of data breach, as we know, shouldn't be taken lightly. So by offering training and certification to their employees, uh, companies basically demonstrate a com commitment to the to the to the data security or data protection and, uh, and system security. So, uh, um, you know, that kind of gives confidence to their customer base, uh, customer loyalty and, and commitment. You know, back to the earlier question um, or answer about why would an individual want to get certified? You know, I thought to myself, you know, one thing it shows since most people do certification in their own time is that you're not just a nine to fiver you're somebody who takes your domain seriously and you invest your personal time, oftentimes your personal funds uh, to master your craft. So I think that's a huge benefit. I, I know reaching from my own experience, uh, when I was early in my IT career, I really needed to kind of bolster my resume and I got Microsoft certification. So I got MCSC certification back you know, in the NT 4.0 days. And it really helped set me apart. It really showed that, wow, this is a guy who plows his time and his money and he reads books and sets up networks at home um, to go ahead and get certified. And it gave me a story to tell through my interviewing process because you know, I didn't at that time have hands-on experience with all those technologies in an enterprise environment, but I at least had a working knowledge having set them up in a lab at home and so having that certification also showed that I had a proficiency at a certain level. You know, also another experience, I have a PMP certification. Now that one was one where um, for anybody who has PMP, they know you need to have five years of career experience in project management prior to going to, and getting the PMP certification. So I was much further along in my career at that point. I had five years of project management. And oh, by the way, that was one of the hardest exams I've ever taken, including all my college exams and et cetera, et cetera. But um, so I guess turning that into a question for you, Henry, is kind of when in a person's professional career would they be qualified or when would it make sense for them to take the IMI certification exams or does it depend on the exam itself? Yeah, it, it depends on the program, right? So we have, so, so our applications for certification uh, uh, is based on experience, education and other certifications, right? So uh, it's, it's based on a point system. So some, some, some certifications may require you to have uh, 20 points, which is like basically either two years of education or experience or uh, having two certifications, each, each one counting for 10 points. Um, or 40 or 60 or 80, depends on the level. So the higher you go into, uh, let's say, technical aspects of governance, you're going to require more education experience and certification in order to sit for one of our certification programs. And so uh, my recommendation is if somebody is um, 
interested, uh, they should apply as soon as they qualify for either one of the certifications. So uh, let's say one certification requires 20 points and another uh, 40. Um, again, um, if money is not an issue, they should probably go for that uh, first certification while they're waiting to uh, accumulate more points to uh, get to the next one. So the sooner the better, depends, depending on their objectives and um, financial situation, I would say. So are there any shortcuts <laughs> that, that, can, that you can take if, let's say you're somebody who's done the IAM space and you know for a long time, uh, you know, colleges sometimes have things where you can kind of test out, right, before we kind of go through programs, things like that. Um, is there anything similar to that approach where, you know, maybe there's like a, a waiver or something in, in lieu of some other requirement? Yeah, at this point, you know, out of our eight certifications, we have three certifications that have exam waivers uh, for people who qualify based on the requirements in, in each of the respective applications. Those three certifications uh, include uh, the uh, CIGE in governance, SIMP, and SIST. So if someone has the requirements, they can apply, uh, they can submit the application, it's risk-free. Uh, you don't have to pay until you get approved, right? So you submit the application, uh, our team reviews the application, and if they qualify, then they become certified. Uh, the other five, Unfortunately, at this point, they have to get the study guide and they have to take an exam and pass the exam in order to get certified. So that seems like if you've got a couple of certifications, maybe where you've been in the air, you know, in the space for a long time, right? There's, you said, you know, there's no really risk to it. You know, try to get, try to shoot for that and see if you qualify for that waiver. And, uh, and then, and then, you know, essentially you get some alphabet stack <laughs> stuff to add after your name at some point. Um, that seems like a good way to approach it. Now, if you're not in that situation, right, where you have the, the experience or requisite knowledge, um, how does someone go about prepping and getting ready to take, you know, some of the testing for either those certifications or the other ones uh, that do require uh, the exam? Yeah, so our programs are, are set in a way that, you know, uh, people basically have the uh, minimum information or knowledge they need for the certification, but all of our programs that require an exam come with a study guide. So, uh, and also a short video that covers the overview of the certification. Uh, that study guide along with the basic knowledge that they have through experience or uh, education is enough for them to sit for the exam. And one of the benefits of our programs is that uh, our uh, candidates um, can take the exam up to three times at no additional cost. So um, if, if you fail the exam the first time, you can schedule and take it a second and third time. Um, most people, most people pass it the first time, uh, and if they don't, they don't. They, they, there's no other financial commitment. They can retake it within the one-year period, uh, as long as their uh, their membership is active. So, um, yeah. So I, I would say there is no risk uh, if they want to go, uh, if they want to apply for uh, the waiver for the thirty certifications, other than the commitment of time to kind of fill out the application and submit or go for the um, uh, certification that requires an exam, again, the risk is very low because uh, you know we offer all these benefits. Yeah, that's that's really good tidbit right there because I know a lot of people who are really sharp people do all the studying and then they get nervous when they go and take tests and they they say, I'm not a good test taker. I, speaking of my Microsoft tests, I think I took 15 of them total, passed them all first try. I thought to myself, I could become a professional test taker. Uh, but I know that most people aren't like that. And the fact that someone could go back and retake uh, within the year, I think that's a, a great benefit. Uh, I'm interested, Henry, and I think probably a lot of people are interested. How can I get more information? How can I research these eight programs that you have, uh, get more information about, you know, how I can prepare, what, what's involved, the whole gamut. What, what's the best resource for that? The best resource I would say uh, is our website, right? So uh, every certification is uh, explained in, in its uh, unique page. Uh, uh, our website is identitymanagementinstitute.org. Um, all the information is there in terms of membership, uh, certification, applications, requirements, um, 
And by the way, I, I forgot to mention that all of the exams currently are uh, 100 multiple choice questions at this time. So um, if, if somebody was interested, but pretty much all of our website, um, our, our website has all the information, but also I would suggest people to join our LinkedIn company page. Um, we uh, post updates there. Uh, they can interact. They can join our other groups, uh, identity theft or uh, CISO groups uh, through the company page in LinkedIn so that they can interact with other members, um, um, learn from them or exchange information, but also uh, receive updates from us. Uh, we also send newsletters. If somebody is interested, they can subscribe to our newsletter called Identity Management Journal. Uh, we send periodic articles. Um, we are very proud of publishing uh, periodic articles on various topics. Our blog is very popular. We have thousands of followers and, and readers. Um, and um, so uh, whenever a, an article is uh, newsworthy or important, we send the news that are out. Recently, we published a series of articles on uh, identity management roles and responsibilities for consultants, for engineers, uh, uh, various salaries for those roles. And we also recently um, published a series of articles on uh, DeFi, uh, decentralized finance, blockchain, uh, decentralized app. Um, we're getting slowly into that area, which, uh, as you may know, is uh, becoming a very hot area um, that, that's going to affect fi the, the financial institutions. So I'm wondering, um, you know, I, I was thinking of those exams that I've taken, they're usually at like a, a Prometrics type facility. Um, how are your exams proctored? Are they online? Or are they in a facility? And then that got me thinking about if they are in a facility, you've got COVID issues nowadays. And I'm wondering, has COVID had any impact on on your organization or, or you know, if you are using Prometrics? Uh, for example, uh, has there been a COVID impact? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question, right? So COVID hasn't impacted us at all because uh, we were online from the beginning. And in fact, I would say COVID has helped our organization grow even faster because uh, people are home, um, you know, they're uh, browsing the internet, they want to learn new things and they come across our articles or website and uh, they decide um, to get certified and join us. And so... Um, no, it hasn't impacted us. So we, we for, for examination, we use uh, the uh, um, a platform that many universities and colleges use. Um, and um, so it's basically IP tracking. It has uh, 90 minutes of time limit for the examination. Um, so all the controls that need to be in place that the, all the colleges and universities are, are, are accepting uh, are included in our examination. Well, you stole my questions, Jim, because I was going to ask the exact same thing around, you know, how does the test taking process work? And then, you know, Henry, you answered my question too around COVID. And I was, I was curious if you guys saw a bump in certifications with people staying home. And it sounds like yes, which is, you know, great news, more, more people in the industry, qualified people, people who know what they're talking about. And uh, that's, that's a good sign. Um, other than, uh, Identity Management Institute training, um, you know, newsletters, et cetera. Are there other things that you can recommend to the people who are listening and, and Jim and I to check out to, to help people keep sharp in either in the IM space or, you know, even just, uh, you know, business skills, right? Being able to articulate or present or whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, I tell you what I do, right? So um, I, I, I spent a lot of time on YouTube and Google. Uh, I research, uh, I find the topic of interest, uh, like lately I've been watching a lot of uh, expert videos on DeFi, blockchain, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, uh, basically given the, the fact that there's a lot of fraud and theft in the cryptocurrency wallet uh, area. So I started, it, it's very educational. So I would recommend um, watching YouTube videos on a specific topic, uh, reading articles, uh, speaking to experts, uh, again, you know, joining uh, uh, LinkedIn groups and um, um, following, uh, subscribing to various newsletters and following different groups to kind of uh, stay in touch and what the latest trends are. Uh, but personally, also because I write a lot, I, I write a lot of articles. I edit most of the articles that are published on IMI um, website. Uh, it's, uh, it keeps me sharp um, in all areas of interest. Uh, 
I may not have an interest in all areas, but I really pick the areas that I like and do research and start writing about it so that I can share my opinion on what I think uh, uh, about those areas. One other thing I wanted to mention about the exam, um, one of the other benefits is that people can, the exam is online, right? And uh, people can schedule to take the exam on any day of the year, except for a few black updates that we have throughout the year for system updates. Uh, the uh, people can schedule with only five days advance notice. They can take the exam online on any day. Uh, the exam becomes available on that day, but from the moment that they log in, uh, they have 90 minutes to complete and submit the test. So I think that's another benefit for people who um, work from home or are busy, they need to schedule an exam on a weekend or they wanna take the test at 11 p.m. Um, that's not a problem with our programs. That's, a, that's actually a really good point. That's, that's a really fast turnaround. Usually there's you know months of lag times, I'm thinking of things like your CISSP, for example, right, where there's only like two tests per year, right, or something like that. So this is something where if people are interested, they can kind of hop on it right away. Um, you know, Henry, I know you've been very generous with your time. Um, Jim, do you have anything you want to bring up with Henry? Yeah, I, I just one thing that Henry mentioned also was around the membership. And I kind of thought to myself, it sounds almost like there's a community within the IMI. And so is, is there, do you kind of foster interaction between the members or how does, how does that work? Yeah. So um, that's a good question, Jim. Uh, you have to be a member to be certified. So you can't just apply for certification if you're not a member of IMI. So all of our certified professionals are also members of IMI. And the way that we encourage interaction, again, is through our LinkedIn groups and LinkedIn company page. Um, um, you know, we post all of our articles there. People uh, comment on those articles. They either like, share, or comment on them. Uh, we also have uh, various groups, uh, Identity Theft and CISO. Uh, people join to uh, post their own articles and maybe share their own opinions. Uh, and so, yes, we encourage uh, interaction among members. And um, But the membership is a requirement for, for certification. It's a good point to know. Um, before we let you go, you, you sparked my interest when you mentioned blockchain. This is something that I've been kind of thinking about too over the last year. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, based on what you've learned on the blockchain side of things, you know, where do you see it fitting into the identity space uh, either, you know, in the immediate future, or is this something that is really more of a strategic thing several years still out? from, you know, let's say really kind of applicable uses for most enterprises or organizations? Yeah, I think, I think uh, it, we may be years away from um, blockchain application and identity management, uh, primarily around privacy. I think uh, if we go the route of giving individuals control of their private information through blockchain, um, that, uh, that may become um, that may become useful, but I think there's going to be a lot of regulations around it. And so, the although the technology is there, um, uh, I'm not sure if collectively organizations and governments are ready uh, to move in that direction. But uh, you know, as 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 uh, DeFi picks up, and and you probably heard of distributed uh, 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 data storage uh, uh, in the cloud, um, that that may take off uh, sooner than later, I think within two or three years. Uh, but as far as giving people control of their private information, that may be years away. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. I, I struggle with finding, uh, you know, reasonable use cases. It seems to me almost kind of like it's a technology in search of a problem sometimes, and people are kind of trying to shoehorn it into a bunch of different areas. Um, I don't see really any valid enterprise use cases, but I certainly see the benefits when it comes to self-sovereign ID um, you know, things like uh, civic when it comes to government, you know, maybe healthcare, right? Being able to kind of control your, your, your patient data and your health records, mm -hmm. things like that, maybe schooling. But I feel like the same way. I think it's still in that ideation and phase where, you know, people kind of need to figure out how does this fit and is, does it fit, right? It's, I don't think it's a, a broad tool. I think it's going to be more of a niche tool, but I know it's a little bit off the kind of the conversation that we were talking right. about, but you mentioned it and it's very rare that it comes up. So I, I wanted to jump on top of it. <laughs> so I appreciate you engaging with me on that one. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's very relevant. And that's, uh, you know, technology changes all the time and we have to leverage anytime we can. 
Um, so uh, th this this whole uh, area is going to explode in the next few years, I think. Yeah, I I, I think there's potential there. It's just you know it's like finding the right key for the right lock and and getting right. it in place. So. Well, you've right. been super generous with your time and, and Jim and I really appreciate it. Before we let you go, are there any other you know words of wisdom or things that you could impart upon uh, the folks who are listening or for Jim and I? Uh, no, not really. I mean, uh, I want to thank you for your time as well. Uh, this is, you know, the exchange of information is valuable for me too. It, it's not a one-way uh, exchange and I really appreciated your time. Thank you so much. Jim, is there anything that you want to bring up? I uh, just, yeah, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, who would take what exam and or what certification? And I guess kind of my perspective, you know, from my own career is that, you know, having experience in areas where they're not your specialty. So say you are a technologist, understanding the risk professional or the governance side of the house, or if you are the governance side of the house, understanding uh, the technical side and then the, the data protection all of these different areas, which may not be your lane, if you will, they're going to help complete and make you a more well-rounded person. And for, for my money, that's the, the track and the way you need to think about your career in order to keep moving up um, kind of in importance from uh, whether it's consulting or you never know which way your career is going to take you, but to kind of move into the upper echelon of, of a company, it's having a more broad understanding. And these topics are focused around IEM and around information security and risk more broadly. Uh, but I think that's where we need to get, right? When you reach a certain point in your career, it's kind of all these skills and knowledge that you've stacked up along the way. So I wouldn't look at it as just, I wanna become certified in what I do every day. That's great, that is important, don't get me wrong, but expanding your scope a little bit um, is, I think, a very big key to kind of moving your, your career forward. And by the way, it might open your eyes to something that you're really interested in and you really want to put some focus on. Yeah, those are all great points. And I think the only thing I'll add to that is, you know, people need to understand that it's their career and, you know, you need to control your career. So the more that you invest into yourself with certifications and education and learning, right, the better that you're going to be off, you know, yourself. So, I think that's probably the the main thing to to consider is you know take control of your career and um, you know good things will will generally happen. So, um, all right, I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, appreciate it, Henry and Jim. Thanks again for for joining us. And with that, we'll go go ahead and wrap it up for this week. Um, I'll have uh, links to the IMI and um, both LinkedIn and their direct website, as well as being able to connect with Henry and LinkedIn and Jim and myself. Um, you know, we're all open to that as well. And you can find out more about us at identityatthecenter.com. You can see us on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. And with that, thanks for listening and stay healthy. You've been listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. For more episodes, visit identityatthecenter.com.